Well, I asked, where's the beef? Let's call this for what this is. Oh my God. <laughs> they are so hopelessly woke. How dare you? <laughs> that is the intellectual capital of the left today. Give me a break. You are now watching the Daily Roundup. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Rebel News Daily Roundup. I'm your host, Sheila Gunn-Reed, and I'm joined by my co-host, Alexa Lavoie. Normally, the show is hosted by our friend David Menzies and one of the frequent travelers through the show here, myself or some of the other talent. But today, um, it's me, it's Alexa, because they're doing some work in the studio. Alexa, how's it going? I'm pretty good, and you? Oh, I'm good. I'm still recovering from our documentary tour of the country. Mm -hmm. I want to say it was a cross-country documentary tour, but we crisscrossed the country several times, um, taking some pretty oppressive flights just to save money. But um, it was exciting to be able to bring the documentary directly to the congregations that lived it. It's, it's anxiety-inducing because you want to make sure you did mm -hmm. a good job because the people who lived it are going to see it. Um, and I think based on the feedback we got, I think we did a pretty good job. Um, but it, it's exhausting and we're not done yet. I think Kian and I are home for maybe a week or so, maybe 10 days before we start it up again. But um, it, if people want to see what I'm talking about, they can go to churchunderfiremovie.com mm -hmm. or savethechristians.com. And that's where you'll see the trailer um, and information on the upcoming screenings or how you can bring mm -hmm. a screening to you of our new documentary, Church Under Fire, Canada's War on Christianity. They can find that there. And I'm, I'm, I think it's one of the most important things that we've ever done here at Rebel News because uh, the people who did this to us want us to forget and I'm not going to let them. The congregations might forgive. I'm not ready yet, um, but we should never forget. But for a perspective that someone who saw it, it was just amazing, really moving. Um, I almost cried at one point. I was like, oh, my God, I was not expecting that. But actually, like Sheila, you did an incredible job, especially with uh, Kian. Was just, uh, I was there for the Ottawa screening, and it was just amazing. Yeah, and I'm, I'm so grateful for your help. Um yeah, it, it's there are parts at which Kian and I, I mean, we made the documentary and there's uh, some parts that Kian still can't watch. And I think it's uh, for him, it's the little children being yanked away from their fathers f for their father's crimes of, I don't know, holding church. I can't even believe we're saying that, but that's what Canada was like for three years. And the documentary details the fact that this didn't happen in a bubble. There was slow mm -hmm. Trudeau government picking away at religious freedom until it was, I guess, for the majority of Canadians, perfectly acceptable to haul away pastors in handcuffs. So anyway, that's our documentary. I'm very proud of it. We, I flew home very, very early from Winnipeg Monday morning so we could do our final screening Monday night at Church in the Vine. And it was, uh, it was enormous. We had over 500 people there. It was just a, a packed... Wow um sanctuary it was uh, it was amazing it was great and uh we're gonna i am it was tiring um but i'm sort of sad that it, that part is over i it's kind of fun being on the road i'm not used to sleeping mm -hmm. laying down you never I sleep because you never sleep <laughs> well, i did i did most of my sleeping on an airplane just slumped over like this <laughs> Anyway, we should uh, tell everybody what we're doing here today. Enough about what I've been up to. This is the Rebel News <laughs> Daily Roundup. It's, as I said, normally hosted by my friend David Menzies and one of um, his colleagues here at Rebel News. And we talk about the news of the day completely unscripted. And it gives us a chance to interact with each other, which is great because I work remotely. So I don't, I, I you know, I talk to people on the computer, but it's nice to talk to people, uh, at least video, my my friends and colleagues here at Rebel News, but we also get to talk to you. And one of the ways that you can do that is by leaving us a paid chat. If you are watching us on YouTube, might I remind you, YouTube is a censorship platform. So if you want to interact with us, uh, why don't you leave us a paid chat over on Rumble? On Rumble, it's called a Rumble Rant. On Odyssey, it's called the Hyper Chat. You can also become involved in our locals.com community where you'll get access to all of our paywalled content and you can support our work out of the goodness of your heart on like the mandatory requirement Justin Trudeau has for you to support the work of mainstream media journalists that you neither like, agree with, or uh, care to support. 
um, you can leave us a paid chat and we will do our best to read it on the air. Uh, usually I read them towards the end of the show and it's a great way to keep you watching <laughs> to the very end. <laughs> I think <that laughs> I do that on purpose. Um, so uh, <sighs> that's everything. Uh, let's jump right in to uh, this thing that happened yesterday. And it was really incredible because I got a text message from uh, Ezra, who at, at yeah. the time was in Hungary, and then I heard from my friend Tamara Leach, whom uh, asked me to become her best friend, and I'm like, okay, I will. <laughs> she, <laughs> she did that at our documentary screening in Calgary. She sort of put me on the spot. Mm. On the spot, I'm like, I guess you did it in front of, in front of 300 people, so I guess we're we're besties for life now. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> she she won her and her lawyers. Um, and she's, um, I should remind everybody, she's being represented by the Democracy Fund. And mm -hmm. if you want to contribute contribute to her legal fees, because she is in for uh, just an absolute uh, wild ride of a trial in September, you can do that at helptamara.com. Uh, she faces multiple charges of um, mischief, counseling to commit mischief, obstruction, for basically honking her horn and saying, hold the line. As part of the Freedom Convoy, she was one of the lead organizers herself and Chris Barber. Um, that's the, for those of you who don't know, and I don't know how you couldn't, Alexa, you were there for the duration mm -hmm. of the Freedom Convoy in Ottawa in late January and February 2022. It was an anti-mandate um, demonstration led by truckers, but then joined by thousands of their allies against COVID restrictions and I think it was the single largest human rights demonstration of, I think, modern Canadian history, entirely peaceful. And so, of course, since these were the most effective opposition that Justin Trudeau has ever faced, he broke out a counterterrorism law called the Emergencies Act, never used before, uh, to euthanize the protest and arrest the convoy leaders and seize the assets of convoy supporters. Tamara, yesterday, she goes to trial in... September. And what happened was her lawyers argued that the Crown is taking far too long to turn over their evidence because they go to trial in, you know, like, like a month and a half. And the Crown was saying, look, we need to, well, we need until August, I think it was 8th, to turn over the evidence, which would give Tamara's lawyers less than a month to prepare. And this is the crown. They arrested Tamara. They held her for, I think, 49 days um, mm -hmm. on nonviolent charges. And they've had well over a year to turn over the evidence. They haven't done it yet. They're asking for a, a long timeline. Tamara's lawyers were able to successfully argue that that those documents need to be in the hands of uh, Tamir's lawyers by August 1st, which is a huge victory. It gives them an extra, I think, week, eight days to prepare, which um, is vital in being able to launch uh, a reasonable defense of Tamara. Um, you can see that the Crown is playing games here. And frankly, the judge uh, said that it was unacceptable that the Crown wasn't turning over uh, evidence in a reasonable amount of time. So that that's great. I think that bodes well. Tamara's team is still going to have to work very hard because they don't have a ton of time to prepare. And the, I think the Crown did that on purpose. So um, that is excellent news for Tamara and her lawyers. And uh, it's nice to see things going her way for once. It's it's obviously that they do that in purpose. Just look at um, my own trial, trying to defend myself. It's still like uh, no date have been booked. Still waiting, like maybe it will happen in 2024. It seems like they are just postponing it and make it like maybe more difficult to remember like all the small detail and after that using that against you. Yeah. Yeah, and, and with Tamer in Tamara's case, she's got trial in six mm -hmm. weeks. They've had this evidence for over a year, year and a half. They have.
In a world plagued by conformity, where truth is distorted, freedom is a distant memory, and Big Brother is always watching. One man, Winston Smith, looks to break through his bleak existence. Introducing the all-new Rebel Illustrated Classics edition of George Orwell's iconic book, 1984. Now, more than ever, in the age of lockdowns, 15-minute cities, and World Economic Forum globalism, everyone must read 1984. Uncover the hidden depths of this literary classic with our exclusive illustrated edition that brings Orwell's haunting vision to life, reborn with a foreword by Ezra Levant and 30 captivating new illustrations by artist Paul Revoch. You see that Orwell is not only explaining what might come, but in my opinion, what's already here, even back when he wrote it in 1949, but much more so as we see revealed today, particularly with the last three years. Join the rebellion against conformity. Get your hands on the Rebel Illustrated Classics edition of 1984, now available at buy1984.com. Oh, hi, everybody. Oh. Welcome back. <laughs> we had a power outage in the office in Toronto where Olivia is running the equipment that broadcasts us. And so uh, you were watching Thanks, us. Olivia. And all of a sudden it works. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Olivia. Sorry about um, the stress of having to boot everything back up. At first, I thought it was me because... Me too. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm on Skype, so I thought, oh, Bill Gates is canceling me. I went to check my internet, which is Elon Musk internet, which was fine and dandy, but as it turns out, it was a problem in the studio in Toronto. So hopefully, we'll welcome everybody back and let's continue on talking about the business of the day. But I was letting everybody know that if you wanted to access Tamara's book, Tamara Leach's book, um, it's called "Hold the Line: My Story from the Heart of the Freedom Convoy," and you can get that at theconvoybook.com and be sure to check there because Tamara Leach is on a cross country tour, mm -hmm. uh, book signing tour. And so if you would like to see how you can get the book or support her tour or find a way to bring the tour to your community, it's right there uh, at Hold the Line, My Story from the Heart of the Freedom Convoy. It's theconvoybook.com theconvoybook.com uh, not just convoybook.com I don't know where that takes you but it's theconvoybook.com okay let's uh, continue on because um, a senator said something completely normal and so the media is losing their mind <laughs> there um, it's Senator Michael McDonald put the Ottawa residents in their place um, and Alexa you were there um, in Ottawa yeah for the duration of the convoy. And I was very recently mm -hmm. in Ottawa and uh, what a boring city. And, and no offense to the people who oh, live yeah. there, but um, no offense to the people who are who live there. Um, there are some great people and some great rebel supporters and people who care about freedom there, but they are governed by the most boring fun burglars I've ever seen in my life. Um, you would think that this place was an absolute morgue, the way they cherish silence. Um, and treat people who are a little bit rambunctious as though they were are terrorists. So Senator Michael McDonald said, um, it's not your goddamn city just because you have a six-figure salary and you work 20 hours a week, <laughs> saying of all the government workers there. Um, he went on a bit of a tear, uh, scolding the people who live in Ottawa about how they treated the Freedom Convoy. Look, if you don't want... Uh, to experience things that happen in a nation's capital, maybe don't live there. But these well-kept government workers, the laptop class, they were outraged that these blue-collar people came and expressed their dismay at what was happening to them. And se conservative senator Michael McDonald stood up for them, and he is absolutely right. But as it turns out, he was in he is in trouble. And he said this as the Freedom Convoy was happening, which was a breath of fresh air because as the Freedom Convoy was happening. Aaron O'Toole was still the leader of the Conservative Party, and he couldn't get off his rump to support the truckers, but McDonald did. Um, he It was caught on a video in February 2022, castigating downtown Ottawa residents who complained about the weeks-long demonstrations against COVID-19 pandemic-related restrictions and the Liberal government. In the video, McDonald described the residents as overpaid and underworked. Perfect. Exactly. He said, it's everybody's effing city. 
exactly. It is our nation's capital. Where else are you supposed to go to protest the nation's government? Um, this is the capital of the country. It's not your goddamn city just because you have a six-figure salary and you work 20 hours a week. Uh, I want this guy to lead the Conservative Party of Canada. I just don't want him to be a senator. Anyways, you haven't worked a full week in two years. It's sickening, McDonald says in the recording. In the video, McDonald refers to his wife as a Karen. A derogatory... <laughs> oh, he's probably in trouble with his wife. A derogatory term for a self-entitled woman for opposing the protesters. So he's even mad at his wife because she didn't like the protest. Despite police ordering protesters to clear the scene, McDonald adds that I don't want them to leave. He apparently apologized for his remarks, which he should not have done. And now the watchdog has, oh, he claimed that he was drinking. But you know what? I'm not, uh, he was on the truth serum <laughs> is what I think happened here. <laughs> um, and uh, we've all been there, by the way, where I'm just like, I got to get a few things off my chest mm -hmm. after I'm three Coors Lights deep. Anyway, <laughs> um, he, uh, it's been ruled now that he breached six sections of the code that governs senators leaving a significant impact on the institution. He literally stuck up for Canadians. Uh, why even have different political parties in the Senate if everybody has to agree with the liberals on anything that happens in this country? Mm -hmm. uh, they ruled senators are expected to represent Canadians, not denigrate, mock, and demean them while encouraging illegal activities at a time when a state of emergency had been declared, wrote the busybody who wrote the report. Um, but, but this guy minute. did the right thing. Oh, it's not Justin Trudeau who did that too, and there is no punishment to him to have done all this too? You know, that is a very excellent uh, point that you're making, although this uh, Justin Trudeau is not governed by Senate ethics rules. In fact, <laughs> I would argue that Justin Trudeau apparently is not governed by any ethics rules. But yeah, it's a bit much for these people to be wringing their hands and saying, do not uh, leave a significant impact on the institution in a way that would uh, draw the institution into uh ill repute when you have the prime minister of the country running around saying i'm not sure we should have space for these people what does that mean if there's no space mm -hmm. for somebody like me should i just what are you going to do to me are you going to deport me what is, like what <laughs> does that mean like what are you going to do to me if you shouldn't should we even tolerate these people? Mr. Love and Tolerance says we shouldn't tolerate these people. If you're unvaccinated, don't think you could get on a plane or a train and sit beside me. By the way, I don't want to sit beside Justin Trudeau because A, I fear groping, but B, that guy gets COVID more than anybody I've ever met. You know, every time you turn around, he's constantly got COVID. I don't want COVID from him. Plus, I like to sleep on planes and trains and I don't want to get fondled in my sleep by some gropey, mm -hmm. self-entitled weirdo. But yeah, like Justin Trudeau said things far worse than the accurate things that this guy has said about uh, my fellow Canadian citizens and everybody uh, is... Well, not everybody, but apparently all the liberals who are mad at this senator are perfectly fine with it. But I think, like, example, like some of the senator was muscled for, like, a part of the pandemic. And now yeah. he had the chance to express himself because he had the opportunity open to him. And what he says is actually, like, pretty true. Like, not for everybody who live in Ottawa that are all overpay for what they are doing but for some of the people who work for the bureaucracy of the parliament or for the government that apply probably to them and uh, I think uh, what he say is just expressing some of the concern of uh, a big part of Canadian yeah for sure I mean he is right to point out that a lot of the people in Ottawa, these work from home laptop class, they heard the work the full day in several years. Um, and they were looking down their smug entitled noses. And this is not the entire bureaucracy. You know what? Uh, traveling around this country, showing our documentary, I've met a lot of people who are grinding it out inside the democracy 
fighting mm. or inside the bureaucracy fighting for freedom. There are good people in there who are inside the gears of the machinery and I have nothing but pity for, for them being a free thinker inside of a place that requires absolute ideological homogeneity. However, I'm actually curious. The, do you, do you, do, did you hear like any ghost honking? Uh, yeah, no kidding. No, I didn't hear any ghost honking, but I did hear horns honk. And I was like, terrorist, you're a terrorist. Be careful. Um, but uh, the the laptop class were looking down their smug noses at people who just wanted to go to work and put in a full work week. Mm -hmm. These truckers, these people who just wanted to say, I don't want to take this medicine so that I can have the job I've always had so I can support my family. I don't want to have to take an inoculation against unemployment instead of a disease so that I can go to work. And they were these people who had absolute complete job security and easy living were the ones who were just uh, being so judgmental and mean to these truckers mm -hmm. who just came to protest for their livelihood. So, you know, he's he's right. He's right. Uh, we should move ahead uh, because we're halfway through the show and we had a big mm -hmm. uh, technical catastrophe there. Olivia, do you want to do an ad break or should we just skip it? It's your call. Okay, so we'll keep going. Uh, let's go into uh, climate nonsense. One of my favorite things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because uh, every weather event now is somehow a catastrophe caused by my comfortable SUV. Uh, we've got this video here. It's from the Kukaloos at Just Stop Oil, um, who generally use oil to get to their protest locations. But that's a, something, <laughs> that's a point that's completely lost on them. Um, I remember, I think it was Extinction Rebellion. They blocked a bunch of... Uh, roads mm -hmm. in Edmonton and they had the yeah. like worst uh old junker of a pickup truck and I love I'm a farmer I love an old junker of a pickup truck but I'm not lecturing people about their carbon footprint this thing was like blowing blue smoke uh, <laughs> and that's what they came to the protest in and I'm like <laughs> hello um but anyways just stop oil in the UK uh they painted the department responsible for issuing over 100 new oil and gas licenses in the UK. Let's watch this video. Okay. What yeah. was that? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how that convinces me not to use oil and gas. In fact, the cleanup for that um, vandalism is probably going to require a lot of yeah. hydrocarbon-based chemicals to dissolve yeah. the paint, which I'm not sure is water-based. It's probably not. Um, even in their protest, um, of course, they must know that it's not going to remain covered in orange paint. Look at this guy. Honestly. Um, it's net zero orange. I'm not sure. But anyway. And this is, I uh, would say like it would, it would probably have like less charge and charges against him that probably Tamara did receive for having like not doing vandalism like that and this is a nonsense because do they know that the paint is not being created by nature you need to do a whole process that create some gas yeah. that will contribute to climate change <laughs> these people are absolute idiots i'm not sure how they think doing stuff like that gets anybody on their side even if you believed that uh, the world is going to be killed by your commute, even if you believe that. How do you support these people who are vandalizing government property uh, to prove a point? 
I, I, I don't mm. understand. Like, I don't know whose hearts and minds they're changing when they're doing this sort of stuff. And, and especially, like, they are asking to stop oil now. Okay. What are you going to do? Like, all the people will, like, go to work. All the people will continue to produce. Oh, you want to stop yeah. that now? This will create a real crisis, what you are actually claiming, asking now. Well, and I also enjoy the fact that most of these people are vegans for the environment. And eat however you want. I definitely eat however I want. But uh, they will go and eat their bananas, uh, their organic bananas and their organic avocados. And I'm pretty sure there are no banana ranches in London, in the, in the UK. And their avocados have to come in on a truck. So while they mm -hmm. say, I don't eat beef or I don't eat chicken or I don't eat pork because of the environmental impact, your food is coming halfway across the world in a refrigerated vehicle to you so that you can pat yourself on the back and say, look, I went vegan for the animals and for the climate. In the meantime, uh, you are wasting away and your hair is falling out and you're constantly cold because, and you can't think clearly because you don't have any DHA or B12 or all those things that the human body needs to function. These, these are the last and, and, people you need to be <laughs> taking advice from about anything. <laughs> And by the way, your bean that you consume is probably not hand picking. It's probably like a machine that oh, yeah. makes like your bean. <laughs> of course, unless you want to pay slave wages to some poor person yeah. uh, in the other part of the world. Uh, let's go to this tweet from Karina Gould, uh, Liberal MP. I'm going to open it on my computer if I don't have if she doesn't have me blocked. Oh, I'm blocked. So, so. Oh. <laughs> No surprise. Uh, Karina I'm Gould, not, though. <laughs> a liberal MP. This is her tweet. It says, Canada is a leader when it comes to advancing 2030 agenda on sustainable development. I'm here in New York. Uh, the sky looks nice and hazy and smoggy in New York <laughs> to represent Canada at the UN and highlight Canada's progress on meeting our targets. Canada 2030 agenda. What a chilling hashtag, by the way. But um, as an Albertan, I will kindly say, stuff it, lady, because we're mm -hmm. not doing any of that. And our premier told you that she's not going to. And as the country's leading hydro hydrocarbon producer, we are not going to do that which you want us to do. And I guess we'll probably just see you in court. But we're not shutting down our oil industry. So you can go to the UN and virtue signal in a very... Yeah. smoggy vehicle filled city you're going to tell me that my husband can't go to work while you're in the un sucking exhaust fumes sorry no thank you <laughs> it's actually what i was thinking what she's doing is only like virtue signaling just to show that what they are doing is like right but in the same time what you see in the background is doesn't follow with what with the action <laughs> yeah like out here in beautiful alberta where, you know, the, well, if we don't have a forest fire, it's pretty clean and pristine here. We have this incredible ability to reclaim um, oil and gas sites and um, the guys go to work in the most beautiful environments. And, you know, a lot of people who work in the oil patch, of course, they're outdoorsy, they're conservationists, they leave the place as, as nice as they can when they, when uh, a job site is done. And you got to listen to these people in an urban jungle of mm -hmm. <laughs> New York tell you that you're the problem. No, thank you. We'll do what we do. And uh, all those cars in, in New York, they need fuel. Someone's got to drive. You, you're from Alberta. I'm, um, I'm actually curious to have your take on the fact that if Alberta is complying to reduce the production of oil, um, that means that a lot, lots of jobs would be lost. How people react about this? Oh, we're not going to do it. We, <laughs> we lived through uh, the NDP complying with Justin Trudeau's environmentalist policies from 2015 to 2019. And every day, it was hundreds and hundreds of jobs. Like every single day, you would open up the newspaper as if anybody reads the newspaper. You would open up your phone and it would just be news articles about 800 jobs here, 1,000 jobs there, companies leaving, ConocoPhillips leaving. Um, 
Shell leaving, these major oil and gas multinationals saying, actually, we're going to go work in Russia. We're going to go work in Kazakhstan because that's a safer economic climate for us to do business. And those jobs would just disappear. And, you know, or they would go to places like West Texas and uh, North Dakota. So the oil is still being drilled. Mm -hmm. Uh, The gas is still being fracked. They just weren't doing it in Alberta. Those companies took their capital and and it didn't die. It, they invested somewhere else. So those jobs were lost here, but they were gained somewhere else. Um, and often in places without an environmental record and human rights record like what we have here. Or on the flip side, you get uh, the best and brightest from Canada working in Russia, working in Kazakhstan to develop their oil fields and their resources. And that's a brain drain that is completely lost here. And it takes the industry years to recover from. My husband was one of those expats who worked overseas in one of the more oppressive regimes of the world back then because the work dried up here. But the oil needs to come from somewhere. Um, Karina Gould is still taking her flights. And so um, it, all it does is hurt, it all it does is hurt Canada while somebody else benefits. And so we're not we're just not doing it here. Our premier said no. Um, and so we're not. And I'm so excited. And I'm happy to hear it. Yeah, and I hope that everybody will test the first electric airplane will be a bunch of politicians. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they won't. You know, they won't. They'll be like, oh, look, at the, we'll just put some truckers in there. <laughs> um, oh. Now, on, on the theme of there is nothing that uh, climate change can't do. Apparently, climate change has murdered this young man, according to the mainstream media. Um, but these, this reminds me of Dina Hinshaw uh, standing on the grave of the young boy who died of brain cancer to say that he was a COVID death of somebody under the age of 18. So this young boy had dangerous asthma. Not mild asthma, but something enough to kill him. And it did. And wildfire smoke induced it. No. It's an irritant for people with respiratory illnesses. I get it. But that's yeah. not climate change. That's not climate change. Climate change didn't kill this kid. Seasonal wildfires did it. And probably the seasonal wildfires are also exacerbated by poor forest management. But here we are. And there, this oh, it's a tragedy that this young man died. But is it climate but, change? No. You why, why knowing that you have like this condition, why they didn't take their precaution having like some uh, oxygen, having like some, like trying to not let him going outside as much as possible, having like a good ventilation. Like, you know, this person have like already a condition that can be affected by the fire, like the smoke that was outside. So is it really the climate change or the negligence? Not only this, this is not this boy's doctor. If I don't know where the family stands on this, but if this were, um, if this were my doctor, I would be looking for a new doctor. I would be off mm-hmm. the rev limiter. Um, about this. This is a, a little tiny boy. I think he's nine years old, was it? Oh, um, yeah. And they're saying it's a moral imperative for governments to end our dependence on fossil fuels before more kids like Carter die. Um, try running a hospital without fossil fuels. Try. Try running an autoclave on solar energy. Um, so what? You're, when the wind doesn't blow, you just don't finish the operation? Try running a hospital without plastics, without cleaning supplies, without reliable electricity. People die. That's what's happening in the developing world. Go to sub-Saharan Africa and experience their medical system there. That's what happens when you don't have an abundance of cheap, reliable electricity and fossil fuels to run a hospital. Fossil fuels in the medical system save lives, and these crazy people are blaming it on uh, climate change. So the one guy, uh, one of these people here says, whenever, uh, as the province 
experiences greater impacts from the effects of climate change, British Columbians are learning about the risks associated with wildfire smoke, extreme heat, and under other environmental factors. This greater awareness can help us respond when risks are identified. And then uh, there's a family doctor in Vancouver who says uh, that it is basically has to do with uh, climate change. And he's a family doctor in Vancouver. Like, what are you doing? You didn't see this boy. He's from 100 Mile House. I don't know. Oh, you can it's get awful. to these conclusion without having like, even having the kids as, as patient. Because children's deaths are things we all, uh, we all dislike. It's, you know, like mm -hmm. older people, they die. They die. It's, you get old, you die. Nobody makes it out of here alive, as my mm -hmm. friend Natalie Johnson says. Um, but young people, there's a special kind of tragedy in them dying. And uh, so these ghouls love to use it to uh, control the behavior of other people. That's why I would call the COVID press conferences every day where they would like recite the numbers of dead and the people in the hospital. I would call it the daily necromancer session because they were, I mean, for all intents and purposes, it was necromancy using the death, death to control the mm -hmm. living. Um, and this is what they're trying to do now. And I think it's just a, a real tragedy. I think it's gross. I agree with that. Uh, let's move ahead to this tweet. Um, we saw on Twitter, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Lion Advocacy. Um, this is pretty funny. So <laughs> the city of Toronto wants to ban two-stroke engines, small equipment, so lawnmowers, leaf blowers, chainsaws. Now, they, there are, I think Montreal even did this. Now, they tried to claim it was initially for uh, to keep the noise down, but it's a major city. I don't know why people think that it should be absolutely silent. If you want silence... Move to where I am. Um, but if you live in a city, expect noise and, and people, right? But oh, then, I, in uh, Montreal, the, 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 the finally put, finally, I, I find that stupid, but they put sheep into the park to just like eat the grass. So this is oh, really you know, silence. I'm so excited. <laughs> you know what? I, I'm, I'm kind of excited because, um, anyways, just to finish this tweet, but the city will let okay. you rent, rent electric equipment via a lending library and this I, as uh line advocacy points out you'll own nothing and be happy this sounds a lot like the world economic forum saying you can't own these things but you can rent these things and you don't need to own these things um so oh. uh it's a low emission equipment lending library you'll own nothing and be happy now on your point mm. of the sheep <laughs> yeah I, mu I must tell you I'm from Fort Saskatchewan, and uh, I think we were the first, uh, we're a very small city, um, and at the time when we started doing this, much smaller than we are now, um, but Fort Saskatchewan, my industrial city in the agricultural industrial heartland, I would suggest of this country, uh, in a place we call uh, Upgrader Alley, <laughs> Oil Upgrader Alley, we've been grazing our sheep in our city parks for like 30 years um, because it's, we're farmers. <laughs> sheep yeah. don't cost a lot of money. They don't, we, I don't think we did it for emissions reasons. The sheep were just really convenient. We're a farming mm -hmm. community. Um, you graze your sheep, your sheep eat, they fertilize as they go. And it was like a novelty. And um, now our mascot is a sheep, Augie, uh, because we were initially called uh, Fort Augustine or Augustine, depending on how you say it. And we have these, uh, a statue in downtown Fort Saskatchewan, if there's such a place, it's really not, um, of a bronze sheep. So uh, good job, green Montreal. You're catching up to my oil patch town. <laughs> but they did it for a, like a different reason. At them, it's like really to, you know, help with climate change, you know, you know, like Valérie Planck, she's part of the C40 cities, and she, yeah. she already started to uh, separate some of the area. I think it's Rosemont. Uh, in, she actually divide pl the, the municipality as a 15-minute city. It's already started in Montreal. She's really like pushing really much on um, climate change, uh, some fight against it. And 
It's why, like, we see, like, some nonsense appearing, like, everywhere. We even saw, like, some uh, pamphlet being distributed to the, the people saying that if they want to help with climate change, do want kids less. <laughs> Gross. See, we do it. We did it, like, because it was, like, cheap, cost-effective, kind of fun. It was, like, it's a gimmick. <laughs> at this mm -hmm. point why we do it here uh, we even have like a parade for like when the sheep return in the fall we have like oh. a goodbye uh, we have a goodbye <laughs> for our sheep when they like return to their farmer's fields um but i i th it's comical that green montreal is following 30 years behind <laughs> my very industrial oil patch town it makes me happy these hippies are discovering common sense just they took the long way <laughs> it's kind of fun <laughs> um let's hit an ad break and then we'll touch on uh the story that uh you covered about the teen facing criminal charges for remo removing the lgbtq flag and then it will take some chats if we have um but let's hit that ad break first everyone how's it going so i want to talk to you for just a moment here at rebel news we understand what it's like to be independent to try and get by uh, without big handouts from the government small business owners business owners alike out there understand that like nobody else that's why we might be able to partner up and, and do something incredible bring a captive audience and new eyes to your business or your product if you think we might be able to partner up and if you want to support independent journalism while growing your brand to a captive audience well reach out to us you can do so by going to rebelnews.com slash advertise my mug i know it's pretty cool so is this hoodie i got on and you could have it on too if you check out our special website at rebelnewsstore.com that's where you can see freedom focus hoodies that we have for you beanies cell phone cases you name it all while supporting our journalism where we fight to bring you the other side of the story as opposed to you know being forced by the trudeau government to fund leftist media out of your taxes the truth is Without you and your generosity, there is no Rebel News. So again, if you like the reports that we bring you and that we also fight for freedoms in Canada, please consider doing some shopping, picking up some swag at rebelnewsstore.com. We appreciate your support. Okay, great. Before we get into your story, I just want to touch on this one really, really quick. Yeah. Uh, it's from Prince Edward Island, uh, a place with more senators than people, uh, <laughs> more representation <laughs> in the Senate than uh, anywhere else per capita in the country. Because why? Because you're liberal. Um, women's pro-disc golf event in PEI canceled over sports policy on trans athletes. It's very much saying this sport is not inclusive of anyone but cis men. I'm not you know what? sure that's what that's what's happening here because I think they're doing it the, to protect the women. Uh, the Disc Golf Pro Tour has scrapped its women's division at an event scheduled to take place on Prince Edward Island over concerns with the sports policy on trans athletes. Several hundred competitors from around the world to, were set to compete in Rose Valley PEI this September in Canada's first professional disc golf tournament. And then the trans... Uh, activists ruined everything for everybody. But tour organizers announced over the weekend that the women's division was being canceled in PEI in several U.S. states. The decision follows two lawsuits in the U.S. by Natalie Ryan, a transgender female golf disc golfer who is no longer eligible to play under new rules issued by the Professional Disc Golf Association. Actually, I don't think that's true. I don't think it's not that she's ineligible to play. She's just ineligible, ineligible to play with the women, she should be playing with the biological men. Yeah. Uh, uh, competitive fairness is the underpinning of the disc golf pro tour, the professional disc golf industry, and all of elite competitive sport worldwide, CEO Jeff Spring said in a written statement. We will not waver in the PDGA gender eligibility policy. That said, I want to affirm the concept that you can simultaneously respect and support transgender people and support competitive fairness. These are not mutually exclusive concepts and the DGPT will continue to show respect for all people involved while thinking creatively about long-term solutions for this challenging issue. So basically 
this person wants to play and compete unfairly against the women. And the uh, tour said, nope, uh, that's not fair. So we're not going to run an unfair event. We're just not going to have an event where you are obviously going to win because you're competing against people who are uh, smaller, have a uh, smaller bone structure, smaller cardiovascular system, smaller um, heart capacity, lung capacity, all those things. Uh, no way lower testosterone levels, smaller muscle mass. He just said to protect the fairness of the sport, we can't run as a competition where you are playing in the women's division. And uh, apparently that is somehow, according to the activists, unfair. Well, I'm sorry, but if, this individual, if we oh really, my Oh, Lord. my God. <laughs> I was saying that if that individual really wants to play, um, it will go to the men league. It's just because he know that he will lose in the men's league, and he have maybe a chance to compete with the woman and won. But this man, it's not a woman. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm actually I'm like really way. shocked. I'm really in shock I'm... right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you, know what, you know what this this is the part that really bothers me i'm a woman i've been a woman my whole life alexa you're a woman you've been a woman your whole life growing your hair long despite that your define you <laughs> despite your male pattern baldness and putting on a dress does not wave a magic wand and magically turn you into a woman i'm sorry and Andrea McPherson, that person right there, s argues that it's fine for men to compete against women in our sports because elite swimmers like Michael Phelps are better than the men that they compete against. So why can't men who are better than the women that they compete against compete against women? So elite athletes like swimmer Michael Phelps and NBA basketball players benefit from a different kind of genetic advantage all the time. Mm -hmm. So why even bother to try to make it fair? Good argument, my dude. <laughs> but I, I, actually, when you look at this individual, it doesn't at least take the time to at least look a little bit feminine. It's just like put his hair long and pretend that he is a woman. At least like you do a a small effort to be a little bit like feminine. This is insulting. <laughs> like, this yeah, is just it is. like an absolute insult. Um, uh, it I, I just, I don't know. I don't know how um, feminists put up with this. I have no idea. I, I, I don't know. It's just an absolute mockery. And just what a joke. What a joke. And uh, you know what? Good for the disc golf people. Um, and if there are female athletes who are disappointed, take it up with the dude because the disc golf people were trying to protect you from this. And uh, apparently you can't, you just can't in Canada. I'm sorry. Uh, we should bump ahead to your story because yeah. uh, I've got a meeting to jump into after this, uh, after we do the live You're stream. Too busy. And I, uh, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I'm happy to be busy. I'm happy to be home for a little bit. Um, let's talk about the story of the kid who now faces criminal charges for removing an LGBTQ plus flag in school. 16 year old kid from uh, Montreal, uh, mm -hmm. May 16th. Uh, yeah. He's facing criminal charges. They're criminalizing. Uh, what I think is a pretty minor event. I don't think he would face charges if he took down a Canadian flag. Mm -mm. I don't think so. But the thing is, like, go, I was talking with the mom and, and the son, and they, they were a little bit, like, concerned because now these criminal charges can, like, follow him for his adult life. And, um, and especially because they didn't mention... Um, nobody like did really look into the fact that he was the first one to be aggressed by a group of individuals from the LGBTQ yeah. community when they tried to rip off the crosses in his neck. And, um, and afterwards, it was like, okay, 
they insult him, insult him in his religion. And after that, it should be like, fine with that. Forget about it. And just say, but they can be res irrespectful to me. Anyway, like they, ha they have like a overprotection because they are from the LGBTQ community. I'm sorry, but respect needs to be earned, as you say. And unfortunately, they didn't earn the respect. It's, it's actually the opposite. So it's just why it, it, it never bothered with them. He said that I usually, you know, ignore them because they are not my friend, but yeah, like we live in the same like school anyway. Like we are just different people, different vision, different ideology. But when they cross the line to rip off his cross that represents his religion, he say, why do I would tolerate your flag when you not even tolerate my religion and myself? Because they don't want tolerance. They want affirmation. They want you to agree with them. It's not enough that you put up with them. They want they want you to confess ideological fealty to their little flag. Um, and where's the hate crime charges against them for assaulting this young man be based on his religion? Nothing, right? Nothing. And they receive... He received already sanction from the school that changed multiple times. And afterwards, they received a month after the, the incident, a call from the Sûreté du Québec. And I reached out to the Sûreté du Québec and I asked, like, who did the complaint? Can, uh, can we know? And it seems like nobody complained about them. Uh, nobody have called the Sûreté du Québec. It's just the Sûreté du Québec took that incident, went to see the DPCP and they just decided together that they will charge them and open like a folder to six teenagers involved. And we see in the video, they are more than six, but they target six individuals between 13 years old and 16 years old, just because it's probably going with the narrative that everybody needs to comply or look at this example of these, these young teenager, what they are facing right now. So sorry for this English, but Shut up and comply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, the the amount of adults who are not speaking out on behalf of these kids, even if you're, you're on the other side of this, uh, they probably should have just called this a wash. Um, he pulled down their flag after they attacked him on the basis of his religion. Call it a wash. But no, only one of them is getting criminal charges. So we understand... Who is higher on the totem pole of civil liberties in this country? And it's not Christians, um, as uh, depicted in our documentary, Church Under Fire. That's absolutely true. Yeah, and I'm really, I would say, like, for the other family, if they want to reach out to me, because now there are six different family, and I know that some of them are Muslim, and I know that um, a lot of Muslim feel like that their government, like, forget about them. So if you want to reach out to me, go ahead and write to me at alexadra at ribbonnews.com and uh, I will keep you uh, under confidentiality if you uh, you prefer that because I understand what can be the consequences afterwards. Yeah, these people will ruin your life. They'll make sure that you are harassed, that you can't be in public. Um, that you can't have a job, that you can't feed your family, that you can't live in peace, all because you just disagree with them. You know, like I mm -hmm. said, it's not it's not about tolerance. It's about agreeing, because if you tolerated somebody else's views and they had nothing to do with you, you would just leave them alone. But that's that's not what's happening here. We should get into some of these chats because we're over time. Um, yep. And uh, these chats are great because people are super generous. We've got one from JCMN84. This is crazy. We had a power outage at the beginning of the show. And uh, it's just it's just a thing that happens. But look at this. Donation to help keep the lights on. Shout out to the still terminated unvaxxed healthcare workers in BC under Adrian Dix slash Bonnie Henry. Freedom to choose. Hire back our heroes. .ca. We need you back. Yeah. So outrageous. This is so generous. Outrageous. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Apparently in BC, you can be uh, afflicted 
with COVID-19, but as long as you're vaccinated, you can go to work. Mm -hmm. Isn't that funny? Um, Okay, let's keep going. We have another $10. Here's a few bucks for the new backup generator from Memory Hole. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. We've got another one. From Ableist SL, five bucks. In response to the extremist animals blocking roads, I want to attach a V plow to a vehicle, a cow catcher, we call them, (laughs) to a vehicle (laughs) so I can shove them out of the way without running them over, making it easier to avoid assault charges. Oh, Mm -hmm. you know you'll get assault charges. Why? Because your politics are wrong. And only some people can cause traffic disruptions in this country and other people, it's perfectly fine because their viewpoints align with the liberals. Uh, Udabursi or Judabursi, I'm not sure. I, I never know how to say it. Ten bucks. They are all going to walk around naked if they want oil and fossil fuel banned. Yes. <laughs> it's true. Ooh, I prefer not. <laughs> yeah, that's another reason to be pro-fossil fuels. I don't want to see environmentalists naked. For any reason. No. Uh, did you see in Montreal? They had like a bicycle like uh, run. Oh, naked everybody bike Everybody was ride. naked. Oh, I was like, whoa, what's that? Like, there is children. I thought it was like an offense to be like naked in front of children or like or showing your genitalia like in public. I didn't know like, like why, why they were able to do that. I thought it was like a certain place where you were able to do some nudists. Yeah. That they used to have colonies for this, but now you can just walk the streets with your wang hanging out or draped across your bicycle seat. They also have this in um, Toronto, the naked bike ride. And uh, I guess it's never been a better time to be a fetish weirdo <laughs> than yeah. 2023, as you can see. <laughs> uh, CJD. Uh, gives us 50 bucks. Aw, thank, thank you, you guys. Uh, 50 bucks. Anyone can have a bad day, especially when under renovation construction. Aw, mm. thanks, guys. Aww, thank you. We are really appreciative of getting real news. Thank you to all. Well, we could not do this without the support of you guys at home. And wow. this It's almost as though we staged it, which we definitely didn't. But Maybe we should consider it. <laughs> we um, should like cut the, got, the power more often. <laughs> yeah. Oops, yeah. Uh, Alberta Dawn confirms what I'm saying about beautiful downtown Fort Saskatchewan. Alberta Dawn gives five bucks and says, I worked in Fort Saskatchewan for 18 months on a project. I went to the park to see the sheep and quickly learned that you don't walk around in the grass with bare feet because of the natural fertilizer. Yes, this is true. Oops, we do have yeah. Uh, as a natural consequence, sheep turds all over the river valley. Um, mm. And then we've got Ableist SL gives us five bucks and says, we should seriously start picketing the Conservative Party of Canada with demands that they merge into the PPC under the conditions they give the PPC full control along with the party name so we get the boomer vote. Uh, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. No, never. Um, no, no, no. Uh, I think the only wise thing for... Um, Paul, you have to do is to say, look, uh, it's different here under uh, Aaron O'Toole and Andrew Scheer. And uh, we realize that you were once Conservative Party of Canada supporters. And we realize that your trust was fractured with us. And we uh, this is a different leadership. And uh, we would like to welcome you back into the fold because you are Mm -hmm. uh, members of the conservative family. Somebody needs to say that to them. That's that's what will cannibalize the PPC. But nobody's ever bothered to reach out to them Uh, when they were once committed Conservative Party voters. Someone should really uh, consider doing that. But uh, Mm -hmm. maybe maybe in time. Uh, I think that's everything. We're all caught up. We're eight minutes out. Alexa, thank you so much for uh, joining me today and not being so not being uh, prickly when I talk too much because I get that (laughs) I get that. I like it. When I'm hosting with somebody other than David that I talk too much, but um, it's just nice. Yeah, to but in the same time, wife. it's like, for me, it's like watching a show. So I'm actually watching you. <laughs> well, that's great. Uh, 
thank you, uh, Olivia and everybody who works behind the scenes in Toronto. You were dealing with a technical catastrophe and you pulled it off like trained professionals. Thank you to everybody who watched the show today in spite of our technical catastrophe. Uh, thank mm-hmm. you to everybody who pitched in so generously to literally keep the lights on. <laughs> like, like you know, yeah. Normally we say thanks for pitching in to keep the lights on around here at Rebel News, but that is what they did today. <laughs> they, yeah. they want us to keep the lights on. So thanks very much. Um, I'm not sure who's hosting tomorrow. It could be me. It could be somebody else. But we will have a show tomorrow. It just won't be um, from the studio in Toronto. Um, yes. And as David Menzies always says, stay sane. Two more seats. That's all that's left for those of you who will be joining some of your favorite rebels on a fact-finding mission to Israel and Dubai this September. Currently, if you head to rebelvacations.com, you can snatch up one or both seats remaining. We'll be spending seven unforgettable days exploring the historic sites of the Holy Land and three more days in the United Arab Emirates. But we won't just be learning about ancient history through tours and seminars. We'll be getting to the bottom of recent history as well. What is life like there since the Abraham Accords, the peace deals in the Middle East that were championed by former President Donald Trump? We'll learn about past issues and current events, including how Israel fights against terrorism. And my personal favorite, we'll get to know each other better. Head to rebelvacations. 